St. Justin Popovich's critique of Papacy is one of the most recurrent uh, themes in his entire opus. One might detect in Justin's view of Papacy several elements uh, that remain permanent in his works and some that depend on the historical context and circumstances. For example, Justin's criticism of pa papal infallibility and the papal claim to universal jurisdictions are recurrent. However, his views on the Vatican ecclesial policy, expressed as a critique of union, concordate, and joint ecumenical activities, are not a constant element in Justin's approach to papacy. In the following lines, I intend to focus on early, middle, and late period in Justin's life and to explore the similarities and differences in his approach to papacy in these three periods. I will first examine St. Justin's early critique of papacy from his Oxford Belit thesis on Dostoevsky and the articles published in the journal Christian's Life. The focus will then, then move to period of 1930s and 1940s. And finally, I will scrutinize Justin's late ecumenical works as well as his letters to the Holy Synod from the 1970s. In the work Philosophy and Religion of uh, Dostoevsky, an Oxford dissertation written in 1919 for the degree of uh, Bachelor of Letters and later uh, published in Serbian in the journal Christian's Life, the young Justin exposes his ecumenical or rather anti-ecumenical views. By following Dostoevsky, the Serbian monk primarily criticized the Roman Catholicism and with it entire European and Western civilization. According to Justin, all difficulties that confront the European people are caused by denying Christ his divine attributes and by reducing him to man, the European man. I quote, the European man did it not want to adjust himself to the God-man out of pride, but he adapted the God-man according to himself, a man. For a long period, the European man has been overestimating himself at the expense of the God-man until he reached the climax of his insanity, a vain dogma of the infallibility of man, which in itself synthesizes the spirit of Europe." End of quote. According to Justin, by promoting the papal dogma of infallibility, Roman Catholicism has become the cause of the origins of atheism, socialism, anarchism, science, culture, civilization, according to man. Similarly to Dostoevsky, Justin says the main reason for issuing the papal dogma of infallibility in the Pope's intention to unite lands and peoples under his spiritual and earthly rule. According to Justin, all social processes which took place in the last centuries in Europe in the form of protests and the Reformation were just a response to his, this papal claim. In an attempt to respond to all these processes, the Roman Catholicism transformed itself for Justin into idolatry of the infallible man in Rome, while the Protestantism, as a reaction to papal claim, transformed itself slowly either to atheism or into, quote, flexible, floating, variable, but not internal morality, end of quote. However, the main problem of the papacy lies, according to Justin, not in an unsatisfied desire for power, but in its attempt to mechanize the person almost to destruction. The self-preservation of one's own eye, which was inaugurated by the papal dogma of infallibility, became the principles of Western science and civilization. For Justin, this desire for self-preservation is the denial of the notion of personhood, which is based on sacrifice or on giving oneself to others. The European science is powerless to solve the problem of personhood because it atomizes the person, reducing it to impersonality. By declaring self-preservation as its basic principle, such science leads to nihilism, which on a personal level, in the last instance, ends in suicide. <laughs> Similar to European science, the European civilization has rejected, according to Justin, the Godman Christ. Therefore, as a small, small part of humankind, the European civilization 
cannot rule over the rest of the world because the ultimate consequence of this contradiction will be the final and devastating political war. For Justin, only the connection between the human person and the person of the God-man, Christ, reveals the mystery of human person. The basic characteristic of the human person is the connection to the person of Christ, by which human being discovers it in himself something immortal and eternal, Christ striving and God likening. Justin's basic concern is to preserve the idea of personhood, establish and sacrifice for, the, for others and not on the principle of self-preservation. Therefore, he is critical of the papal claim to infallibility as an epitome of this tendency in the European culture. One may argue that uh, due to his criticism of the papacy in his Oxford dissertation, Justin adopts an anti-ecumenical stance. However, such a conclusion may be drawn only from a perspective which does not take into account the historical context of distrust between the different Christian dominations that prevail in the second decade of the 20th century in Europe. This distrust began to weaken with the first ecumenical gatherings, such as the Conference of Protestant Churches summoned in Edinburgh in 1910. In any case, Justin's earliest published work should not be taken in isolation from other works published in the same period, mainly in the journal Christian Life. A quick glance of Justin authorial and editorial work in the Christian Life reveals several tendencies in ecumenical affairs, such as strong, critical attitude toward Roman Catholicism and Vatican's Ostpolitik and benevolence towards the Anglican Church. Justin's critique of Roman Catholicism exposed in his dissertation on Dostoevsky was complemented by a series of critical remarks on the, on the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church in Europe at that time. Justin commented upon the encyclical of Pope Pius XI from 12 November uh, 1923 issued to mark the tercentenary of the repose of St. Joseph, the United, United Archbishop of Polotsk, in which the Pope urged the Orientals to, quote, get rid of their prejudice, end of quote, and return to the Roman Church. Justin argued that the office of Uni Unite uh, Archbishop Joseph resulted in great persecution and forced conversion of Orthodox Christians in Poland and captured more than 300 te temples that belong to the Orthodox. Justin reacts to uh, Yeray's article, The Crisis of, of Slavhood, published in 1927 in Ljubljana, in which the author prescribes the papal universalism of the Catholic movement as a therapy that heals the Western Slavs uh, from the alleged sickness of German rationalism and subjectivism and the Eastern Slavs uh, from the alleged sickness of orthodox ascetical mysticism. Several points need to be mentioned here. First, in his Oxford dissertation, the young Justin largely identified his views on the Western churches with the Dostoevsky as it was indicated by his examiners, who called for a critical reflection. While the views of Dostoevsky might be an intellectual construct bay, uh, uh, based more on abstract speculation about Western churches than on the living experience, the young Justin had a chance in Oxford and London to get acquainted with the living Christian tradition of the West. On the basis of this experience, Justin sharpened his critical views on papal claim to jur universal jurisdiction, which were also targeted by Anglican divines. Therefore, Justin's view on the issue of papal infallibility and papal universal jurisdiction did not alter, but they gained a new critical strand as a reaction to Vatican's policy in Yugoslavia. Justin argued against Protestantism by considering it as an expression of Roman Catholicism and as a kind of humanistic Christianity, but he never rejected its Christian character and not dismissed the need to enter in a dialogue with Protestantism.
His criticism of the Serbian Church for failing to respond to the invitation for the Stockholm Ecumenical Conference in 1925 is a valuable proof of his openness. Just an ecumenical openness is most visible in relation to the Anglican Church, with which the Orthodox Church aimed to establish not only close ties, but also prospective unification. Justin's views on Roman Catholicism and papacy deep, are deeply connected with the new reality in Yugoslavia, a state created with strong feeling of pan-Slavic unity. There were political forces in Yugoslavia that propagated the cultural values dominant in the political system of, the West, of Western Europe. In Justin's view, in spite of the evident progress in securing the well-being for its people, Western Europe underwent drastic changes of secularization that already, already had some bleak consequences like the First World War. In light of increasing popularity of communist and revolutionary ideas, that gained great political support among the people of Yugoslavia, another possible direction of the newly created country was to follow the revolutionary road of Russia. None of these possibilities were acceptable for Justin, because both proclaim as the highest value not the in incarnate God or the God-man, but the human being. For Justin, the only difference between European and Soviet humanism is that the former identifies itself with Christianity, while the latter is atheistic in nature. Justin relies on, in his criticism of European humanism on the Slavophile ideas, which he does not propose a solution that is not intrinsic to his own nature, uh, uh, culture. By projecting the dilemma between East and West back to Serbian Middle Ages, Justin proposed a solution apparently offered by the founder of the Serbian Church and its first Archbishop Sensava Nemanjic. Sensava independent position from the dominant political and ecclesial paradigms of Rome and Constantinople enabled Justin to develop Svetosavlje as a tertium quid metaphor meant to transcend East and West narratives. In his works written during the 1930s in the context of Yugoslav Concordate crisis, Justin argued that the papacy was the father of fascism and communism because in, in, it employed violence in the name of God, while communism and fascism used violence in the name of class and nation, respectively. For Justin, the Serbs could resist these challenges by, only by relying on Svetosavlje. Although this might sound odd, and especially in the light of criticism of papacy, for, just, for Justin, Svetosavlje provided the foundation for Yugoslav national and ecumenical project. Like his mentor, Bishop Nikolai Velimirovic, Justin opposed the Pope powers, Pope's power over Catholics in Yugoslavia because he perceived it similarly to the ecclesial rule of Constantinopolitan patriarch over the Ser Orthodox Serbs in the Balkans as an expression of ecclesial imperialism. Svetosavlje is presented in the works of Justin as both the national and ecclesial principle realized within the limits of time and space and the idealized model, idealized model of Christian past presented as the future and universally desired image of a Yugoslav society. Thus, Svetosavlje became the eschatological goal to which the Yugoslav state and society, as well as the Yugoslav church, liberated from the ecclesial rule of Rome and Constantinople should strive. Although Sensava is a historical figure and not a national leader, Justin Doctrinal Svetosavlje has, has been deprived of any national element that is different from or contrary to evangelical principles. By placing St. Sava and Svetoslav not in the national history, but in, a eschatological, in, in the eschatological realm that transcends history, Justin intended to establish an ecumenical platform that is also accept acceptable for Roman Catholic Croats and Slovenes. With the crisis of Yugoslav national idea and the turmoil that preceded the World War II, Svetoslav ceased to be the basis for national and ecclesial unity and it became a more interesting ecclesial principle. 
From the mid-1960s onward, the question of ecumenism and the relationship of the Orthodox Church to it was in Justin's folks. Although the book, The Orthodox Church and Ecumenism, is mainly a compilation of his interwar writings on Western Christianity, the chapter Man and the God-Man reveals his mature views on papacy previously exposed in the article, article about the infallibility of European men from 1969. Justin recapitulates his stance on man and God, man, Europe, humanism, papacy, and dogma of papal infallibility. By the end of this chapter, Justin reflects on the contribution of the Second Vatican Council. He argues that they're reaffirming the infallibility, uh, uh, invaluability of the papal dogma of in infallibility adopted at the First Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council is quote, the renaissance of European humanism and therefore renaissance of corpses, end of quote. Beside such a bleak diagnosis, Justin offers a solution which consists in the whole, whole wholehearted and transfiguring repentance before the God-man. For Justin, the repentance leads to the knowledge that A, the true ecumenism is a catholicity of people gathered in the name of Christ and Christ in their midst. B, the Holy Spirit dwells in God human and not in humanistic categories. C, one needs to preach not ourselves, but the Lord. And D, humanism and humanist Christianity derived from, derived from papism is a heresy. This, not only the rejection of papal dogma of infallibility by the Pope, but also rejection of the infallibility in matters of faith in every, of, by every man and woman in Europe in their repentance before the God-man, creates for Justin a possibility for true union and true Catholicity and ecumenism in the true Church. However, the harsh criticism of papacy should not be read as a face value, but rather as a critic of the ecumenical policy of Orthodox Church. In this his letter to the Synod of the Serbian Church, Justin criticizes the ecumenical Russian and Serbian patriarchates for the same sins as those attributed to the papacy. For Justin, the bishops of the Orthodox Church preach Quote, ecumenism of Protestant syncretism and ecclesticism based on a fruitless European humanism and frantic European anthropocentrism, end of quote. Moreover, Justin considers the alleged neo-papist tendencies in ecumenical patriarch, by, of the ecumenical patriarch, and the papal claims to the universal jurisdiction and fallibility have the same humanist roots. In Justin's view, in both cases, the Pope in Rome and Patriarch in Constantinople replaces the God-man. For, ju for Justin, the attempts of both the Constantinopoli Constantinopolitan and the Moscow Patriarchates to create a super-church by imposing juridical authority on the new churches in the Orthodox diaspora may be compared with a papal claim to universal jurisdiction. This, not, this does not mean that Justin a priori rejects any kind of ecumenism. Justin distinguishes between the humanist ecumenism, which the unity of the church secures by mutual concessions and compromises, and the God-human or orthodox ecumenism, which is for him a testimony of God-human truth spotlessly preserved in the orthodox church. He does not deny he does not deny the need for theological dialogue with the Western churches, but he rather points out that those who adhere to the patristic orthodoxy are obliged to pursue such a dialogue. Justin strongly disapproved the participation of local Orthodox churches, and particularly the participation of the church hierarchy in building a super ecclesial body under the patronage of World Council of Churches or of the Roman Church, as well as joint prayers and worships. In conclusion, one may distinguish in Justin critique of papacy dogmatic elements in the one hand and the political and cultural elements on the other hand. 
In his dogmatic approach to papacy by focusing on the issues of papal infallibility and the claim to universal jurisdiction, Justin is quite traditional from the orthodox point of view. In his views, by insisting on these two elements in their uh, papacy, the modern popes differ themselves from the first millennium God-bearing bishops of Rome. However, in his culture and political critic of papacy, Justin blames the papacy for some modern and social phenomena. Thus, in Justin's early works, the modern papacy is epitome of humanistic tendency in the European culture to, to deprive personhood with the deepest connection with the God-man, and for Justin, the papal claim to infallibility, infallibility substantiates this tendency. By relying on Justin, uh, on, uh, by relying on Nikolai Velimiro, he just criticizes the papacy as an expression of ecclesial imperialism in the interwar period. The, uh, the papal interference in Yugoslav political affairs through the Concordate and Pope's dominion over Catholics in Yugoslavia were for Justin expression of papal imperialism, which were in stark contrast to the anti imperial direction of Yugoslav society. Finally, in his light, uh, latest works and letters, Justin's critique of papacy reflects his critical attitude towards the ecumenical policy of the Orthodox Church. The modern ecumenical dialogue for Justin is not inspired by humility and repentance before the God-man, but on the contrary by the humanist will to power equally expressed in the policies of the Roman Pope and the Constantinopolitan, Russian and Serbian Patriarch. In all of the aforementioned cases, the papacy for Justin remains incompatible with the God-human Christianity. Thank you for your intent. Thank you for your presentation and we are also open for questions and comments. Yeah. Wait for the microphone a second. Uh, thank you for your presentation and for the invitation. Uh, I just had uh, one question because uh, the, the the issue of, of papal primacy was also, uh, I, I don't, you're probably aware of this, was uh, severely opposed by Strossmeyer. Uh, during the, the, the First Vatican Council. So, to what extent uh, did his arguments, uh, well, lengthy arguments, because he held a three-hour speech in Latin during, during the First Vatican Council, uh, against it, to, which, uh, to what extent were his arguments against papal uh, uh, primacy or, or, so, or supremacy were known to both uh, St. Nikolai and, and St. Justin, and to what extent could they have used these arguments in their in their own line of thinking um, uh, against uh, well against uh, uh, against a union with Rome or something like that. But thank you. Uh, this, uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, question. I think that the, the, the good source for these uh, uh, topics uh, for Justin was Nikolai Velimirovich. And Nikolai Velimirovich used this very much in his early letters. And then when they say like a populist at the beginning of the 20th century was the most conservative institution yeah. and not liked by many Catholics uh, at that time. And still in 19, uh, 1907, uh, Velimirovich uh, writes a letter, can a Roman Catholicism uh, can uh, survive without Pope, and then actually giving positive answer that Pope papacy is as a kind of uh, some distortion of, of it would happen like a phenomena. It, and I think that in his views, the papacy for uh, uh, Nicolai was also the rule of of Constantinopolitan uh, patriarchs over over uh, Serbs in the Balkans. In this sense, uh, uh, he quotes in many cases Strossmeyer, but I'm not sure that he was aware of all this because he put Strossmeyer on the level with Negos in this sense and sense and sense on. But it's obvious that that set of subject for, for uh, uh, Nikolai Velimirovic is an ecumenical platform. He is very clear that how many, how many new, new uh, bishoprics will the new church have. Uh, and, and it was a kind of real ecumenical prospect in uniting with Roman Catholics and they said that, and they said, okay, San Sava is, is a Slav, he's, he's a saint of all, all of us and that. And in this, uh, I think that, that uh, Justin is a bit reserved. 
he never he was much more in, in this kind of eternal things not going to another level of politics on the level of culture but in an ecclesial things he never uh, put this but you can follow by following Nikolai uh, you see that actually he's picking up certain ideas with Nikolai and try to develop this idea whether he's going to be obedient to his teacher and just trying to repeat and de develop in his own way or he's uh, just on the track and then this is also when uh, but when you uh, that when they uh, criticize Pope, this is from the beginning to the end. But, uh, nothing positive is there, you know. But Pope in, in, in modern sense, not in, uh, when they say, when he's uh, in, you can find in lives of, uh, uh, of, of saints, you can find very nice description of Roman popes. And I say it's like, a, you know, uh, Leo is, is speaking with the mouth of Peter, that kind of, it means that the Pope of Rome, even Pope kind of it's not a problem the name but this kind of infallibility it means that he's actually placing this in in the 18th I would say the 18th century 19th century that's kind of distortion that's kind of this period of uh, yeah. Uh, that, that, that this, that this people don't want to the call it will be, is only going to bring trouble, uh, especially to the East, because de uh, uh, facto the whole Western Church recognizes this as the Supreme Authority, but if we can put this in writing, we're not going to get rid of this for another thousand years. So, uh, uh, and uh, I'm just asking because uh, him and, and, and the Nikolai were and, and the second source is, is Nectarius of Egina. That's the second source because he's using and actually he's speaking, he's speaking because normally Nectarius Egina reply to all, all this uh, papal encyclicals toward the uh, uh, like a Orthodox Church, like a repent and return and that kind of thing. And he was very tour. And then you can find that he was using in the lives of the sentiment that he was writing that he is actually you can find this idea is his early work probably he picked up this during the 20s uh, from like a 23 to 26 from from Greek sources well, if I'm just a, one should add also the idea of St. Kirill and method as a Catholic church as a counter so to say ideology to Cirillo uh, Metodska idea which was in the like early early 20th century developed as a counter thing to, to Svetosav. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that he used to criticize you know Moscow or something over the period yes. and you mentioned uh, the same uh, Metallics. Yeah. And it's interesting when I studied him his letter to the Giotta Ferrata in Rome so when the monks ask him you know how do we solve these, these issues between our churches he actually answered the rather papistic way for an author. He said, the Pope and our patriarch, not Bishop, but the Pope and our patriarch must meet and solve it. So, you know, <laughs> Who said that? St. Italius. Okay, okay. Which also shows us the Glota Ferrata, the uh -huh. uh, Byzantine monastery on the Pope outside of the uh -huh, world. Okay. And, it's, and it shows that what St. Newton was criticized in Constantinople, and that we may be seeing even more today, yeah. of their papistic ideology even was present in this saint who just thank you said the Pope and the Patriarch one must be that's all yeah, well, he is against that kind of things. He's obviously, and he's not even, he's questioning actually participation even of priests who are, who are representing uh, their local churches. It means like, uh, theologically, yes, but on that kind of level, that was not the issue. Uh, Do I have to Just very briefly, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that, if I heard well, Father Dustin not only, as you said, remained open for a dialogue with other Ecclesiastical bodies in the ecumenical sense, but that he also says, wrote somewhere that it is a duty to. Yes. Yes. If that okay, so I. It's a letter. Well. It's a letter. Could you even like a, let, let us have the source. Where, where, where is uh, this? This is le his letter to to Holy Synod from 1977. Thank you. From 19? No, 1977. 77. Yeah, it's one of his last yeah, yeah, letters. Yeah, yeah. Who and uh, he's yeah. long. They said that he well attack is on a Constantinopolitan. I, I, missed it, and I yeah. think it's extremely uh, extremely yeah, 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 yeah. for church's way to put things. Yeah, um, but when you look, you can find this late ecumenism. You can say the early ecumenism. 
you can find in this kind of he was kind of uh, you mentioned uh, when when uh, Hadlam was here he was uh, amazed why he was not received by Serbian church and, and Serbian government yeah. received him yeah. that when Charles Gore when was he, in, when Charles visited. Gore was and he was attacking he was attacking actually uh, uh, Meletius Metaxakis for bringing Gore into into uh, uh, Constantinople for the council and it's, what he's doing we already reach a kind of dogmatic agreement and uh, he's buying now uh, the exactly yeah. exactly yeah thank you well should we call yeah now? thank you very much for your presentation now we have the